So hi everyone, uh, my name is Chris Lauren. I'm a technical sales specialist for ITM Instruments. Thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar today brought to you by ITM University. Today's topic is EBSC safety maintenance with Fluke. We'll be covering a good amount of information over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, we will have time at the end of the presentation for some Q&A. So please throughout the presentation, submit any and all questions that you do have. You can do so in two ways, using the chat feature or using the uh, question feature. Um, uh, throughout the presentation, a certain slide jumps out at you, you have a question about that, shoot it in there and we should have plenty of time at the end of the presentation to get to any and all of your questions. Uh, ITM and Fluke have been working together and very closely for many years. We pride ourselves on being a leading distributor of Fluke in Canada. This is a result of our dedication to offering you our product expertise, service and our competitive pricing. Getting started uh, today, the webinar is presented by Will White from Fluke. Will has worked in the renewable energy industry since 2005 as an installer, designer, project manager. Uh, he's experienced in wind power, solar, thermal, energy storage, and all scales of PV. Uh, Will has primarily focused on residential and small commercial systems. He's passionate about implementing high quality con uh, code compliant installation techniques. In 2016, he joined uh, the SEI and focused on updating and developing course content and teaching in person and online. And in 2002, we'll join Fluke as a solar application specialist where he supports the renewable energy testing equipment uh, like IV curve tracers, electrical, electrical meters, and thermal imaging cameras. Will, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Chris. Great, so today we're talking about electric vehicle supply equipment. We're gonna talk about EV charging, uh, EV charging network trends. We'll talk about the types of electric vehicle charging stations that are out there. We'll also talk about some safety hazards that are encountered when you're working on electric vehicle supply equipment. We'll talk about some tool safety ratings, and we'll talk about testing electric vehicle charging stations and the types of O&M that goes into those uh, stations, O&M being operations and maintenance. And then as Chris mentioned, we'll have some time at the end for some questions and answers, assuming that I uh, don't expand on these slides too much. So taking a look at electric vehicle charging, and this is uh, specifically to the United States, so obviously Canada will be a little different, but you'll get an idea of what to expect for electric vehicle uh, uh, supply equipment growth. This is EV charging ports in the United States broken down by uh, different types of chargers. And we can see 2020, just a little part on the bar graph there, and then going up at a, at a rate of about 16% per year. So a lot going into EV infrastructure, a lot of opportunity when it comes to both uh, building and maintaining electric vehicle supply equipment. There are a couple of different levels of EV chargers. Um, level one and level two residential chargers. These are typically somewhere between about three hundred, three to five hundred, uh, three to seven hundred dollars to purchase. Um, they're designed for EV charging at home. They are supplied either through a dedicated outlet, which usually needs to be installed, or they they can be hardwired in some situations. Um, they are either 120 volt for the level one chargers or 240 volt for level two, and they'll charge up to about 12 kilowatts power. And most are right around the 9.6 kilowatt maximum range. It's going to take somewhere between 10 and 12 hours to fully charge an electric vehicle, um, depending on the size of the battery bank and, and the state of charge when you start charging. Um, Installation, since these typically need a dedicated serve, uh, circuit installed to the charging station, looking around $3,000 uh, US dollars to install those. Very little, if no maintenance on these. They're pretty uh, set it and forget it technology. Uh, so they're, they're pretty straightforward. Next we have our level two commercial or public chargers. Um, to buy these types of chargers, we're typically looking between one and 7,000 US dollars. They're designed to be installed either in public locations or uh, private businesses for the use of the employees. Now, these are, can be either supplied directly from the grid or through the service equipment at the building that they're attached to. They can be done both ways. They're 240 volts, so that's a split phase charge, and they'll do up to about 19.2 kilowatts. 
at that power level, you're talking about two to three hours to fully charge uh, an EV. Uh, installation costs are significantly more than residential because there's a, a bit more infrastructure that goes into them, looking about 12,000 US dollars per unit. The maintenance for these is typically on the troubleshooting end. There's not a lot of annual maintenance that needs to be done, but they, they do have a tendency of needing some uh, repairs from uh, damage or defective parts, things like that. The next level is the fast DC chargers. These are uh, commercial publicly available chargers in most cases. Um, they're more expensive, between twenty dollars to $50,000 just to purchase the, the charger itself. They're designed to be installed in places where people can get easy access to them on highways, um, commercial buildings that get frequent traffic. And these are typically supplied directly from the grid. They, they don't usually go through another building. They have their own direct connection to the utility. They're typically three phase installations, either 208 or 480 volts, power up to 360 kilowatts. So these are, uh, as the name uh, describes, fast chargers, uh, fast charging up to uh, less than an hour in some cases to fully recharge an electric vehicle. Um, installation costs on these are qu quite high, uh, $30,000 per unit. Some of them do need routine maintenance and they see troubleshooting much like the level two public chargers uh, see as well. Um, these costs can be up to about $10,000 per year per unit. Uh, the fast DC chargers are growing at, at a rate that's greater than we see the level two chargers. And I think a lot of that's driven around by the amount of time it takes to charge the vehicle. Uh, our tools in, in the majority of this pre presentation are gonna be focused on the level two chargers. So those could be uh, usually the commercial ones, but could apply to residential as well. So let's just take a quick look at a couple of examples of the difference between a level two commercial public charger and a DC fast charger. So here we have the uh, Fred Myers, which is a, a grocery chain here in the States. Uh, this one is right down the street from uh, Fluke's headquarters in Everett, Washington. Uh, we can see in the, the top right, we've got a couple level two chargers there. There's a, a transformer on site that does not feed directly to the chargers, but uh, feeds the lighting and other receptacles in the parking lot as well. Uh, these are seven kilowatt level two stations, so relatively low power, especially when we compare it to a DC fast charger. Uh, but this is a, a relatively typical installation we'd see on a, on a commercial building. This is a DC fast charger. This is at a Walmart, also in Everett, where Fluke headquarters is. This is a dedicated charging station. We can see at the top right, there are multiple chargers, each with two charging port ports. This has its own dedicated transformer stepping down from the 13.8 kV uh, medium voltage down to 483 phase. Uh, we've got some switch gear in there as well, um, so we can they can uh, turn the feed to these stations off. Uh, these are capable of charging 322 kilowatts, so obviously that's exponentially larger than the, the level two charger that we just saw. Um, this one comes with a T1 or a T2 connector there. Um, again, these ones are, are growing uh, quite quickly. Um, fast chargers, the DC fast chargers are a significant capital investment and they require a lot more planning than a level two charger does. Let's talk about some electrical hazards. Um, this is data from 2020 um, here in the United States. There were 126 uh, fatalities, work-related fatalities that were due to electrical hazards in 2020. Um, there were just over 2,000 non-fatal injuries that involved lost work days. And as we can see from the, the pie chart there, um, almost half of these injuries, uh, these are for the, uh, the, the uh, causes of uh, the fatalities, were done from working on energized parts. Um, the rest, uh, almost all of the rest uh, come from contact from overhead power lines. So working on energized parts, obviously gonna be a pretty extreme hazard. Now, when we're talking about electric vehicle supply equipment, having to open up the equipment to get to the parts, especially if they're still energized, is where uh, one of the major sources of hazards. We could also have ground faults that may energize some non-current carrying metal parts, like the case of the charger itself. And we could have arc faults, which could uh, provide a, a shock hazard, um, fire hazard as well. And depending on the, the type of charger and the, the potential coming from the utility, it could be an arc flash hazard also. 
So we have some industry guidelines. They're going to be a little different between the U.S. and Canada. This presentation is focused on the U.S. because that, that's where I'm from. Um, Chris may be able to speak a little bit more towards the, uh, the Canadian regulations. Um, here in the United States, we have OSHA. We have 1910 and 1926, which regulate both general industry and the construction industry. Those have regulations that revolve around electrical hazards as well. And then we have the uh, NFPA 70E, which is essentially how to implement the hazard uh, requirements that are spelled out in OSHA. So standards there uh, of how we address those uh, requirements and make sure that we're working in the safest way we possibly can. Now, NFPA 70E has some requirements around test instruments. Um, the test instrument shall be rated for the circuit and equipment to which they're connected. So we're going to talk a, a bit about that in some upcoming slides. They need to be designed for the environment. So if we're working outside in an environment where we may be in uh, wet, cold conditions, that tool needs to be rated for those conditions. They need to be visually inspected every time we use them. So we need to look and check and make sure that there's no damage. Um, if there is damage, that needs to be repaired and tested before we use that um, test equipment again. Uh, the Fluke website has a really good lesson on how to inspect uh, electrical uh, testing equipment, specifically multimeters. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, it's a, a really good resource on our website. Um, the installation of the protective tools um, also needs to be tested and verified. Um, we do that at the factory before we send stuff out, um, but we need to uh, make sure that if there's any damage to that, that we uh, test and inspect that as well. Now, one of the main reasons that we're doing these tests and visual inspections and ensuring the safety of our equipment and that it's rated properly for our environment is transient voltage spikes. So a transient is a momentary spike in voltage. We can see the graph here on the right um, goes up really quickly for a very short duration of time. Um, they're caused by a sudden release of stored energy, and that could be a, a motor or other inductive load shutting off. Uh, could be equipment malfunction, could be the utility doing switching on their end, or it could be a lightning strike. In most cases, especially with electric vehicle supply equipment, the surge uh, of transient voltage would be coming from the utility. Um, they're hard to avoid, um, essentially unavoidable, and they're very short duration, but they can be really dangerous. And this last bullet is uh, really a nice way of saying that transient voltages can actually cause major damage to test equipment and can even cause it to, uh, to have fires, arcing, and, and possibly even explode if it's not properly rated. Well, let's talk about the ratings of our test equipment and how we can ensure that they are rated for the environment in the voltage that we're working in. Um, the first thing we need to look at is the category rating. The closer that we get towards the utility, the higher the likelihood and danger of transient voltages are. So the first category we have is category four. This is starting at the utility supply. This is the highest danger that we're gonna get on any of the systems that we're typically working on when we're talking about EV charging. So this would be equipment like transformers, uh, utility meters, the uh, main service disconnect, of anything that's really close to the utility supply is going to be a category four, um, uh, category four work environment. Um, category three is the next step away from the utility. This would be our main service panels, uh, three-phase distribution panels, um, some fixed motors and um, variable frequency drives, depending on how they are connected to uh, the utility and how close to the utility are they are, and um, it also depends on the type of overcurrent protection devices between where you're testing and the utility. Um, the uh, faster those overcurrent protection devices work, the lower the um, chance of danger from transient surges. And finally, we have category two. These are your uh, essentially loads in a building. These are your single phase branch circuits and any connected receptacles. And the uh, in most cases, a level two charger, especially the residential ones, are going to be considered a category two location. 
Now, once we figure out the category, uh, we need to figure out what voltage we're going to be working at. With level two chargers, um, since they're AC chargers, we're typically going to be working with 240 volts. Um, sometimes on the, uh, the DC fast chargers, we'll be working on uh, DC on the output and uh, 208 or 480 on the, the AC side of that, uh, that fast charger. The equipment needs to be rated for both the category that you're working in and the voltage requirements of the equipment. So in this case, category two, uh, 240 volts will meet the requirements for most of the electric vehicle uh, supply equipment that we'll be working in. Um, voltage itself uh, can be met, uh, a little misleading. We need to uh, make sure that the specifications for the equipment we're working on uh, list uh, typically list the voltage of the that the equipment can test, but sometimes the category rating is different. So we want to make sure that we look at that uh, rating and make sure that the the voltage of the test equipment matches the voltage of the category rating. And I'll show some examples of that in a second. Um, the third bullet there is really equipment is really important. Uh, we want to make sure the test leads match the rating of our meter. Now in this uh, electric vehicle charging situation, it's almost a given. Um, sometimes we can run into problems with solar where we're working on high voltage uh, DC solar arrays, like 1500 volt arrays. We need to make sure we have 1500 volt rated test leads as well. So basically the important thing to know is what category environment are you working in and make sure that the meter is rated for that category and the voltage uh, that you're working in as well. So it needs to have both that category rating and the voltage for that specific environment. So here's a picture of our electric vehicle service equipment test meter. Uh, this is the FEV100. It is category two, 250 volt rated. So it will work on any 250 volt AC system. It is capable of working on both 50 and 60 Hertz systems, although we're working at 60 Hertz here in uh, North America. Um, here's some different examples of uh, clamp meters and the different category ratings. This is our 325 clamp meter. It's rated for category three, 600 volt. Uh, category three would be uh, a solar array it is a category three environment. Um, next, we go up to our 378 clamp meter. This is a thousand volt rated at category three. And finally, we have our 393 clamp meter uh, specifically designed for solar installations, which is a 1500 volt rated category three tool. One thing you'll notice here in the pictures, and this is uh, representative of, of actual real life, as the category and voltage rating uh, goes up, or in this case, the voltage rating goes up, the size of the instrument gets bigger. And that's to allow additional uh, creep and clearance because the transients at a higher voltage are more dangerous. So the, we need to make more space so that we can dissipate that, that transient voltage uh, energy in a, in a safe way without causing uh, damage to the meter or uh, uh, hazard to the person using the meter. So the bottom line is we want to do safety first. Uh, when possible, we want to de-energize circuits. Uh, if we're able to work on a circuit to de-energize, we want to follow proper lockout tagout procedures. Uh, there's plenty of resources uh, online available to show what those proper lockout tagout procedures are. Uh, we want to use tools that have been uh, well maintained. We want to use our personal protective equipment if we are working on live equipment. And this could uh, involve any of the things listed here from uh, safety glasses, arc flash uh, clothing, arc flash face shields, even up to full um, arc flash suits, depending on the hazard level of the equipment that we're working on. Um, try not to work alone now. Obviously, if you're working in the field, it, it happens sometimes. Um, what I always say is at, at least have someone on site, be it the homeowner, um, someone working at the building who knows that you're there and working so that if there's ever a, an issue, you have someone there who's able to help out. When we're using our measurement equipment, especially meters to say test voltage, um, we want to follow safe practices. The best way to do it is to attach the lead to the grounded conductor first, uh, that'd be the neutral, and then to our hot conductor, either L1, L2, or L3 uh, second. And then when we're disconnecting our meter, we're going to do that in re reverse. We're going to disconnect the hot leads first, and then the grounded conductor second. 
if we are working on de-energized circuits that we've locked out, tagged out, we need to verify that those circuits are actually de-energized. And we're going to use a method called uh, live dead live testing. So um, first, we're going to test our meter against a known circuit that could be a circuit that's energized. It could be a, a proving unit like we have here, the Fluke uh, PRV240. Um, does both DC and AC voltage. Uh, that's a known voltage source. We can test that. Uh, we should get around 240 volts. Then we'll test the circuit that we're planning on working on to ensure that it, there is no voltage present. And then we're going to retest our known voltage source in order to ensure that the meter didn't stop working while we were testing the, the circuit that we plan on working on. Um, live, dead, uh, live testing is really important to ensure that uh, the circuit is actually de-energized and we're not working on something that uh, got energized by accident. There's some specifications around electric vehicle supply equipment. Um, IEC 61851 is a standard, as is uh, SAE J1772. Um, we can use those to determine what tests need to be done when we're maintaining our electric vehicle charging stations. Um, those tests include uh, checking for ground faults, uh, checking to make sure the insulation of the wires uh, haven't been compromised, um, typically the wires going from the charging station to the plug, so that, that cord going to the, the vehicle. Now, we're checking the voltage on the contacts of the electric vehicle charging uh, port to make sure that it's within specifications. And then we want to make sure that the charger and the vehicle can communicate with each other. And we're going to test that, uh, that control pilot, which is the signal coming from uh, the car to the electric vehicle charging station, and make sure that the charging station responds to those signals. So when we go to test or troubleshoot an electric vehicle service equipment, um, how do the techs do this? What are they doing to ensure that that station is working properly? Uh, one of the most common ways, especially now, is to have an electric vehicle there uh, to connect to that EV charger to ensure that the charger is actually working. Uh, when they connect the charger to the electric vehicle, um, the vehicle sends a control signal to the uh, EV charger and tells it what voltage and uh, current it should output to the vehicle um, to charge it up. Um, when you don't have a vehicle there or the appropriate test equipment, there's going to be no voltage on that connector coming out of the EV uh, supply equipment. So you need at least an electric vehicle or some type of test equipment that can uh, essentially turn that EV charging station on in order to be able to test it. Uh, we're also finding that uh, electric vehicle supply equipment has a high failure rate. Um, the study from SAE showed somewhere between a 30 and 50% failure rate of uh, electric vehicle chargers. And having reliable electric vehicle charging infrastructure is uh, really critically important as we're scaling up the electric vehicle industry. So what are some common problems that technicians run into when they're troubleshooting electric vehicle chargers? Um, first off, if you don't have a, an electric vehicle um, or a, the proper tool, you're not gonna get the electric vehicle charger to turn on. So we need to ensure that uh, we have that capability of actually operating the electric vehicle charging station in order to be able to test it. Um, if for some reason we, we don't have that capability, we may have to go back and repeat tests. Um, using an electric vehicle around uh, for troubleshooting electric vehicle charging stations uh, creates its own problems. First off, is the problem with the electric vehicle or is it with the charging station? It can be hard to tell uh, which one is the cause of the problem. Um, Electric vehicles uh, need to be charged up. If they're fully charged already, and you're the technician going out to, uh, to test or troubleshoot a charging station, then you're gonna have a problem if your EV is already charged up. Um, EVs are also in relatively short supply, so not all technicians uh, necessarily have access to them. Um, they also have different adapters, so different stations have different adapters as do different vehicles, so we need to make sure we have the uh, correct adapter for that specific charging station in that, that specific vehicle. Um, right now, there, there aren't a lot of solutions um, on the market. Um, the Fluke FEV100 is one of the options that, that are available for technicians. So the FEV100 is a, essentially an electric vehicle emulator, so when you plug it into the charging station, it uh, emulates the uh, control pilot signal to the charging station and will get the charging station to turn on without actually having to have an electric vehicle connected to that charging station. 
The test adapter itself, the FEV100 can conduct several tests. Um, the first thing you will do is check the uh, protective earth ground to ensure that there's no voltage going to ground. That's a, a safety test before we do any other tests. Um, we can initiate a control pilot signal from the FEV100 to essentially turn that EV vehicle charging station on. We can uh, have notifications of the uh, protective earth or the control pilot error. Uh, we can also test the ground fault protection device that's built into the EV chargers. There's a, a, a setting on the FEV100 that essentially trips that GFI in the charger, uh, which should stop charging coming from the uh, EVSE. The FEV100 is designed to be used with other tools as well. Uh, you can hook uh, multimeters up to it, insulation resistance testers and scope meters to check different parameters coming out of that EV charging station. Um, you can use multimeters or other uh, voltmeters to check the voltage coming from the, the charging station. You can use a scope meter to check the waveform coming from the control pilot to make sure that as you change the control pilot signal coming from the FEV100 that the, the charging station responds uh, appropriately. Um, so this is really designed for technicians doing level two uh, charger maintenance and troubleshooting. And it really makes it a lot easier for the technician to go in and, and know that it's at the charging station that's having the problem and not the electric vehicle. Let's go ahead and look at some of the, the tests that we have with the FEV100. The first is that, that grounding system pretest. We're gonna do this before we do any other testing to make sure that there's no voltage on the ground terminal of the charging station. Um, so we'll, we'll use the FEV100 for that. Um, here you can see in the picture, the, the FEV100 comes with a type one connector. We also have a, a Tesla style connector available as well. So you can change those two connectors out to use it on different types of charging stations. Um, I talked about the ground fault uh, circuit interrupter test. So we can check to make sure that as the electric vehicle is charging, the, if a ground fault uh, should become present, that that station will shut off and stop the charging cycle. Um, it'll also simulate a ground fault. Um, so simulate that ground fault, make sure that the charging station stops and that a new charging cycle doesn't stop until that ground fault is cleared. We can also simulate a control uh, pilot control control pilot error, um, that's error E, and that comes from that uh, SAE J1772 standard. Um, so there's a couple of different situations that can cause this type of error. Uh, if the charging uh, station is disconnected from the utility, um, obviously if you, uh, I'm sorry, if from the vehicle, if you unplug the, the plug from the vehicle, the charging station should uh, discontinue charging. Um, if the charging station uses, loses utility feed, um, if there's some uh, error from the control pilot as well, uh, it should discontinue charging. So we can do some other tests with the FEV100. Uh, we, can uh, we can monitor the voltage coming from the charging station. So we can see these, uh, these three plugs in the front of the FEV100. You can hook a multimeter up to that, uh, like a uh, 875 uh, or 875 max multimeter from Fluke. Um, so you can test the voltage there to see that the voltage is within the, the specifications of the charging station. You can also monitor the uh, charge uh, current coming from the, the charging station. If you have a multimeter that has a duty cycle uh, rating, you can uh, read duty cycle with the multimeter, like our 87.5 multimeter. Uh, you'd actually hook the multimeter up to the, uh, the pr uh, probe ports at the top. And with the FEV100 manual is a table that shows you what percentage duty cycle rates uh, relates to the charging current of that um, charging station. So you can see, actually measure how much current would be delivered to the vehicle without actually having to do a, a direct current measurement. 
We can also uh, look at the waveform coming from the control pilot signal. Um, as you change states with that control pilot signal, um, the waveform changes. Uh, and that's what's being shown here uh, in the picture on the screen. Uh, this technician is uh, monitoring the waveform with one of our fluke scope meters. It's probably a 125B. Um, so we can see that that charging, uh, that control pilot signal and how it changes when we change the control pilot states um, for different um, charging states going through that, uh, you know, the, the charge cycle coming from the electric vehicle. So we went through that uh, a, a bit quicker than I had anticipated. So um, at this time, Chris, uh, we go ahead and, and open it up for some questions. Absolutely. All right, perfect. So uh, yeah, we have plenty of time to get to uh, any, any and all questions that you may have, please let's try and take advantage of having Will with us today to answer all of those questions. Uh, again, you can use the chat feature, you can use the question uh, feature as well. Just a quick note, if you have any questions about you know, product specific, whether we're talking about the FEV100, uh, the 875 multimeter, any of the products that we talked about during the presentation today, um, whether that includes data sheets, manuals, pricing, availability, rental, purchasing, no matter what it is, um, I'm going to invite you to go to itm.com. There you'll find our full product list, pricing, availability, all the data sheets that you need. You'll also have to contact our sales team who can help answer any and all questions relating to that. Uh, these We want to take the time that we have uh, today to go over you know, application specific questions, the questions relating directly to uh, these uh, EV chargers and you know any issues or anything that you've come across. Uh, so again, please use the chat feature or the question feature to get those questions in. Uh, we do have a few questions that came in through the presentation. Uh, one came in uh, coming from, uh, from Gray. Are most injuries due to people having improper equipment or ignoring safety? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and it varies. Uh, a lot of it's due to, to people ignoring the safety uh, safety requirements. Um, you know, if you're doing, especially with electric vehicle charging, you know, it's a little different than solar in that if we need to do some repair on the system, we can de-energize that equipment. Um, there's always a, a way to shut that off, disconnect it from the utility. So working on de-energized equipment is really critical. Um, and there's really no reason to have to work on energized uh, EV chargers. Um, with the FEV100 and other test equipment, we can go through and simulate that charging without having to actually open up the uh, electric vehicle charging station. So that that's a really good, good option. Um, but yeah, having the right equipment uh, and personal protective equipment is key as well. You know, if you're getting into that equipment while it's energized, you should have the appropriate personal protective equipment, be it uh, electri electrically insulated gloves, uh, arc flash face shields, even to full arc flash suits, depending on what level of hazard you're working at. And there, uh, when you get into the arc flash hazards, uh, if you're working a piece of equipment with that hazard present, there should be, at least here in the States, there's a requirement to uh, have an arc flash ha hazard category level rating on the equipment um, and that will vary based on the, the specific site uh, we see it in, in solar especially yeah, service equipment from maybe a 480 volt service equipment on one site might be the same exact equipment on a different site and the arc flash hazard level is different due to the site conditions um, so a professional engineer can help help quantify that hazard perfect uh, so the questions are really streaming in now, um, so please continue to do so. We have plenty of time to get ed to get to any and all, so please keep them coming. Uh, we have a question from Chow. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit long. I'll read and I'll try to decipher a little bit. So it was mentioned during the presentation uh, that the fa failure rate is uh, fairly high. From what you have seen. Do you, do you know what the common modes of failure are on these chargers? Yeah, there, there's a couple different ones. Um, some of them are internal failures. So it, it could be a, a defect with the equipment or some damage internally to the equipment. Um, a lot of it, uh, some, some is communications as well. 
um, you know, you go in to use your app to get into it, and the, the, the charging station is not communicating back to their, their central um, cloud portal. Um, a lot of it is with the cable coming from the charging station um, to the plug. Um, so that, that cable, obviously, you know, it's a, basically a, a, a high, uh, high safety extension cord. Um, and those cables are somewhat prone to damage. Um, vandalism is another one. Um, some people vandalize charging stations. They cut the cable off for the scrap value or just damage it because you know, they want to do something. I don't know why, but um, so yeah, so there, there are some different modes of, of failure to those. That's why we don't see quite as much uh, troubleshooting on the residential side because they're you know, typically it's not only the homeowner using those, um, so they're you know they're not going to damage their own equipment uh, in most cases. So, yeah, those are the the common modes of failure that we're seeing. Perfect. I, I follow up a question again from Chow um, regarding the current measurement. Is there a way to data log the charging session uh, related to voltage, amperage, total power? I'm assuming it relates more a little bit more to using a, a PQA. Yeah, it, it's going to depend on the tool that you're using. Um, the FEV100 is uh, more of a service, uh, it's an emulator. It itself is not doing the measurement. So it really depends on what tool you're using. So if you're using a tool that has Fluke Connect or other um, software that is capable of data logging, then yeah, absolutely, you'd be able to, to data log with that tool. Um, it really depends on what what or test tool that you're using. Fantastic. Uh, next question in from Tom. Uh, is there a best practice scope of work for maintenance of level two chargers? If so, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. And, and uh, I'm going to give you an answer that we typically give at Solar Energy International uh, when we're, we're talking about it, uh, which is read your free manual, RTFM. Um, so you're, it's going to vary by manufacturer. So you really want to go into the manufacturer's instructions and see what their uh, their maintenance requirements are and their testing procedures. Um, if you're working for a company that's specializing in EV charger installation and in, uh, operations and maintenance, um, they're going to have procedures as well. So uh, sorry to punt that question <laughs> a bit, uh, as there there isn't a, a standard at this point. Um, although IEC may, I'd have to look into it a little deeper, but the IEC may, standard may have, a, there may be a standard for uh, testing and measurement of uh, EV supply equipment. Uh, I don't know if they get into it to the point where there's an actual like list. Uh, but I know I do know that they they specify the specific tests that we we spoke about the you know, making sure there's no voltage on the on the grounding conductor, making sure the ground fault interruption device is working properly, uh, making sure that the the voltage and current and the control pilot signal are within the specifications. Uh, but re read the manual. Um, the manual for your specific equipment should give you an idea of what tests need to be done. Perfect. Peter would like a little bit more of a detailed explanation on the meeting uh, when you were discussing the duty cycle and the current measurement, if possible. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, let me see if I can bring up that manual. So the the duty cycle, and it's I'm not a super expert on duty cycle, but it's going to give you a percentage when you when you are measuring the duty cycle. So this is the table. So when you go in and use that um, that multimeter that has a duty cycle capability, it's going to give you a percentage. And that percentage directly relates to the current that the charger, uh, charger can put out. So uh, this one you can see up to 96.5% duty cycle, go up to 80 amps, and then it goes you know, all the way down to, to 6 amps at 9.5% uh, duty cycle. Um, how that measurement is working, uh, I'm not exactly sure on the technical side. I mean, we can follow up with that if you really want to get into the technical details. Um, but yeah, this is this is straight out of the FEV100 manual, um, so it's going to give you that that percentage of uh, what the percentage duty cycle is in the corresponding current there. Perfect. Um, you did touch upon this in an earlier question, uh, but I guess it's worth going over again um, for you know, 
if if we're not if if I guess if maintenance crews are not able to uh, decharge before testing, is our clash gear recommended? It depends. Um, so yes, I mean it's always uh, and I would I'll, I'll make the blanket statement of personal protective equipment is always recommended. Um, the level of hazard that's going to be at that electrical equipment is going to vary. So it's unfortunately it's not easy. There's there's no easy to say yes if you're working on this piece of equipment you just need this one thing because it's going to vary depending on the situation. Um, so as you go from say you know like a residential level two charger to a commercial level two charger to a DC fast charger that hazard level is going to increase. Um, so yeah if you're working on an energized anything um, you should take the appropriate equipment and that's not just to you know limited to electric vehicle supply equipment that goes for working on you know energized load centers or utility meters or any kind of live work that you're doing you should have the the appropriate personal protective equipment um, and that's going to the the if you're working for uh, an employer who has good safety policies they're going to have a policy that says okay if you're working on this type of charger in this type of situation you need this type of uh, personal protective equipment uh, but yeah, anytime you're working on live work, you should you should have personal protective equipment for sure. Fantastic. Yeah, I was I was gonna say maybe to elaborate more would be the, you know, we talked about the level one, level two, and that's that that'd be the best way to explain it. So thank you for that. This is a bit of a two-parter. Bill asked, uh, can the FEV100 uh, simulate a charger load? If not, is there a tool that can? There, the, it doesn't. Um, and that's where the, the duty cycle rating to figure out how much current it can deliver can essentially give you a, a similar reading. Um, I don't know of any piece of equipment that will simulate a load that's available currently. Um, it's something that we've been we've been looking at at Fluke and seeing whether that you know that's a uh, something that's technically viable. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know of anything in the market other than the electric vehicle itself. Uh, Right. Which obviously is a load, so um, having the electric vehicle there would be an option as well. Um, another question, a follow-up question from Gray. This might be a little bit difficult uh, to answer just based on jurisdiction and, and changes um, regarding, you know, different provinces, municipalities, etc. But um, are there specific regulations around what techs need to have in terms of equipment? I guess maybe we'll, we'll stray away from the PPE at this point, but maybe in terms of uh, electrical testing equipment uh, regarding uh, the EV chargers. Yeah, I, I, not that I know of. Uh, you know, I, I don't know of any municipality that requires specific equipment. Um, again, kind of to that the answer I gave about you know what type of uh, what type of tools do we need to have to to do this? You know, it's gonna or what. Uh, tests do we need to do? Uh, and is there a procedure there? Uh, you know, it's going to vary based on the equipment that you're working on, the the, the client that you have, and, and potentially your, your employer as well. Um, I don't know of any jurisdiction that has a specific list of equipment that you have to carry. Um, Chris, you you have you heard of a requirement like that? Uh, nothing on my end. However, um, as we discussed uh, a little bit before the the, the webinar started. These are becoming, you know, a lot of provinces across the across the country are starting to push more and more for these electrical vehicles to come into circulation a lot more gas vehicles out electrical vehicles in. So I would assume that regulations, whether it come directly from government and or possibly from insurance companies uh, who provide the home insurance, the commercial insurance, et cetera, that's where I would see maybe these regulations coming in. Yeah, yeah, and I think they would they would more sort of so dictate the test that needs to be done, not necessarily the equipment you need to do the test. But I mean, I guess they they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tom has a question uh, about the thirty to fifty percent failure rate and um, whether or not you have an opinion on uh, our are certain manufacturers better than others in terms of the charging stations uh, and or to track that failure? Yeah, I, I don't have any insight into that um, as to w w if one brand is better than the other. Um, and I, I, I don't know if that 
there's any data publicly available that that kind of tracks that. Um, I mean, my impression of the why that rate is so high is mostly due to the ability, uh, you know, the, the capacity for uh, uh, to troubleshoot and maintain these systems. I mean, there's just not a lot of service techs out there at this point. Um, you know, the industry is ramping up. Um, people are starting to install these, but they, you know, they haven't really caught up with the operations and maintenance side as well. And and I, I'm sure a lot of the station owners uh, don't realize that oh, you know, that there is some maintenance involved here um, to ma maintain these systems. So uh, I think it has more to do with staffing and uh, attention to whether the stations are working or not, as opposed to uh, the, the quality of the equipment necessarily. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good point that you touched upon the infancy of of the industry as well, and, and it's it booming so quickly that yeah, it, you know, we need some time to catch up, I guess. Yeah. Okay, we actually uh, one of the participants uh, offered um, an answer and a little bit of a quick answer, I guess, to Chow's earlier question about logging um, the. Uh, logging the current and this, that, the other. The 289 multimeter does have the logging function. Do you, do you think that would, that would work? Yeah. Yeah, and any kind of meter that you can plug into the FEV100 will, will log. I mean, again, it's all about the, the test equipment that you're using with it. Um, so yeah, if it has a logging feature, then absolutely. Perfect. Um, uh, another question from Andrew, do you have any, and again, I think this has kind of been touched upon and, you know, but we'll, we'll go, ahead, go ahead and ask the question, ask the question anyway. Um, do you have any uh, opinion on the best devices or best instruments to use during the installation process? Yeah, the, the as far as electric vehicle charging stations themselves, um, I, I don't, you know, we you can go online and read reviews online and kind of compare and contrast. You know, one thing I always look at when I'm looking at equipment, well, there's a couple of things I think about is how long has the manufacturer been in business? So is it like a Schneider that's been around for, you know, decades or is it a relatively new company that's only been around for a couple of years? Um, another thing to think about is their their tech support. You know, are they going to, do they, do they answer the phone when you call them, you know? Uh, how how easy is it to get through to tech support? Um, same thing on the software side. How intuitive is the software? Uh, on test and measurement equipment side, I mean, obviously I, I work for Fluke, so <laughs> I'm partial to the the Fluke equipment uh, for for test and measurement equipment for sure. Perfect. Um, okay. Uh, Ming has a question about. Um, in the breaker, or you know, with the again, it's in the installation, is a ground fault breaker a must-have? Yeah, I believe, I believe they're integrated into every EV charging station. So I, I don't that is I don't think I don't think you need to add a GFCI breaker. That feature is already built into the charging station, so it should should be a problem. Okay, again, this was touched upon, but it's worth going back over again. Josh asked about. What does the maintenance for these chargers look like? You know, we talked about the troubleshooting aspect of it. Um, is there anything else that we can maybe elaborate uh, now that we have a few, you know, a few more minutes left based on the actual maintenance of the chargers themselves? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, the maintenance for DC fast chargers, those are going to have some annual maintenance. Um, I don't know specifically, you know, what the list of things that you need to do are, um, and it's going to vary by manufacturer as well. So, um, you know, the, the, again, I'm going to punt this one to the manufacturers of go read the manufacturer's literature for the one that you're considering, and you can identify exactly what needs to be done. I mean, they'll have the, the maintenance section in the manual that will very clearly tell you what needs to be done every, uh, whatever, uh, you know, time frame it needs to be done, whether it's annual or every so often. Um, but yeah, the, the specific manufacturers will, will be able to provide that equipment, uh, that, that information. Uh, another question is, does Fluke have uh, an instrument to test the fast terminals, the DC terminals right now? Yeah, it, we, we don't at this point. It, it is something that's on our 
on our uh, uh, plan. So we'll keep an eye out for DC fast charging tools in the, in the future. Perfect. So what type of connectors does the FEV100 work on? Yeah, the type one connector is the, the one that it comes with. And that seems to be the most pre prevalent connector on the market at this point. Um, we also have the Tesla connector as well. So you can get that and use that for Tesla charging stations uh, also. Um, so that's that's the, yeah, the two most common ones. Let's see, okay. So uh, another question would be, uh, how could I use the FEV100 to analyze the control pilot signal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, if I actually go back to that last picture there, uh, this one. So the FEV100 has uh, two ports on the top and you can connect the scope meter in there. So the control pilot signal is a variation of the frequency. So it, it, it changes the frequency and that's the signal that tells the charging station to, to change uh, the, the charging rate. Um, so you, you can see on the screen right there, that's, that's the frequency uh, waveform. It's a, it's a square wave. Um, so as the as you turn this this dial right here, the dial changes the control pilot state. Um, so it goes through uh, A through D, I believe. There might be E as well. Um, so as you change that control pilot state, you can see the the frequency change on the scope meter. Um, so that that's how you use it to to see that control pilot signal. Perfect. Uh, so it looks like uh, the last of our questions that have come in so far. Um, a reminder to anyone who you know may have a, that light bulb moment as soon as we disconnect today. If you have any questions that do come up, please go to itm.com. You can see it on the screen right now. Uh, we have different opportunities and different availabilities to connect with one of our technical sales specialists. Uh, that's via live chat, email, also give us a call. Myself, any of my colleagues are available and here to help you in any way we possibly can. If we don't know the answer, we're going to reach out to Will or someone over at Fluke to get the answer for you. So no worries about there. Okay, one last question from Peter. Do Does the FEV100 have any accessories um, that are recommended or needed in terms of, uh, I guess, the question that revolves more about connector plugs, I guess. Um, <laughs> Yeah, are there any adapters or anything uh, that can be purchased? That's a great question. This comes in the box here. So of course, I mean, Fluke's got a whole complement of all kinds of different, you know, plugs and things like that. Um, so in the box, you get the Type Type Two connector here. Um, you get the the FEV100 itself. Um, does it come with any cables? Um, I don't think it comes with any actual. It doesn't come with actually any actual test cables, uh, but those come with the meters. Um, so you should be able to get those with the meters. And they'll, um, they're just a standard, the standard plug that you get with, uh, with any of our, our meters will plug right into it. Yeah, yeah, that's what it comes with. And then there, it comes in, and Chris, you can go on the, uh, I'm sure the ITM website. Um, we have a couple different kit options as well, where the, the FEV100 comes with, uh, multimeter uh, or multimeter and a scope meter, and then you can get it with the Tesla connector as well. Um, so a couple couple of different options there. Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, so that does wrap up all the questions that we've had so far. Um, so, and if if we have any, again, have any questions at the end of it or anything like that, feel free itm.com. Reach out to one of our technical sales staff. Uh, we'll be happy to answer any and all of your questions. Again itm.com for product information, data sheets, manuals, pricing, availability, anything and everything under the sun, and we'll be happy to help you out there. Uh, before we sign off today, I want to say a big thank you for Will for the presentation today. We hope yeah, that thanks. all of you found it informative uh, and helpful, uh, and a big thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, again, and I say it so often in these webinars, itm.com, we are here to help you as much as humanly possible. Uh, we can get our contact information and everything that I have repeated now five or six times. Um, at the end of this webinar, uh, we do have a short survey that we would ask you to please complete. Your feedback is going to assist us in improving these webinars and allow us to bring you more topics that are of interest to you down the line. 
Uh, we do have upcoming webinars as well over the next few weeks and few months. Uh, you can go on to our website, itm.com, under the trainings tab and find previous recordings. Uh, this one will be posted in a week or so. Uh, previous recordings and webinars we've done in previous years, as well as upcoming topics as well. And don't forget that as a thank you for attending the webinar today, your name will be entered into a draw to win $100 on your next online order. The winner will receive an email uh, with all the details about how to claim that prize. So once again, thank you everyone for attending today. And Will, thank you very much. And we wish you all a great day. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.